Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to two passages of scripture. The first one is found in Jeremiah, of the 18th chapter. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working on a wheel. But the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. All the way through scripture, God uses little things like that. There are parables or little illustrations to illustrate spiritual truth. And he was teaching Jeremiah how God was going to deal with Judah, with Israel, if they didn't turn from their sins because they had been marred by sin. Then the next passage is found in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. But at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little by drugs, by alcohol, sexually transmitted disease. The young people of today are the most analyzed in history. They've lived through a technological revolution. The older generations have several options in looking at young people. I consider myself a young people because sometimes I feel young, most of the time. Well, the older people can either ignore us or they can worship us, as some do, or resent us, or love us. However, there are millions of young people who have little parental authority. They have no set values, no moral parameters. They're not told what's right and what's wrong. And young people today have few role models that they can really follow. Some of the role models that they had have come crashing down, and they've become discouraged and disgusted. And many young people today have not been allowed to become children. You became a teenager before you were a child. You have grown up responsibilities and decisions to make. And this puts a tremendous pressure on teenagers as they go through the roughest part of your life. The roughest part of your life is your teenage period. That's when you're changing from a boy to a man or girl to a woman. And it's when the sexual desires are the greatest. It's when the pressures for school are the greatest. And it's tough to be a young person in today's society. And the peer pressure is the toughest. And that's the reason you must take your stand for Christ and let Christ come into your heart and give you supernatural power to live the life in our society. And many young people today live in an unreal world that's been created largely by movies and television. And they have an unrealistic expectation gap. You see, if you, if you see a very complicated situation on television in a film, it's solved within the next 20 or 30 minutes on, in the movie. And then when that same problem comes before you, you think it ought to be solved immediately. And it may take years. But we expect something to be instant. But there's an emptiness and a loneliness and a lack of purpose in the hearts of many of you. The easy availability of drugs, the uncertainty of the times in which we live, the screaming headlines. And you're searching for peace and joy and pleasure. And the Bible says, in thy presence, in, your, in God's presence, is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Do you want real joy, lasting pleasure? Oh yes, you can have a sex experience and have pleasure for a few minutes. But there is no pleasure comparable to the pleasure that Christ can give you. I feel sorry for people today that have sex without love and have sex without being married. 
because in, in the marriage bond, there's no conscience to bother you. There's nothing but complete ecstasy and a joy and a thrill and an excitement that goes far beyond a sex experience that you have in high school. You didn't know that there was an extra dimension to pleasure that you haven't felt yet. In his presence, there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Well, there are thousands of young people today that just goof off. They escape responsibility and run from reality. They're searching for purpose and meaning in their lives. And many of you are asking moral questions. You're wanting to know why. Young people want change, but they have a tendency to ignore sometimes history or even human nature. Young people are searching for hope and security. One well-known man committed suicide. I read about in the paper. He left a note and he said, I have no option. I must kill myself because I'm a man without hope. We've put all the emphasis in our generation on material things of life. Many young people are now rejecting that and they want something more, but they don't know what it is. That something more is Christ. You'll never find the joy and the pleasure and the fulfillment of life unless you know Christ. Young people are searching for a satisfying and meaningful experience. They take drugs and that destroys. They have sex, but they get bored with that or they get AIDS. They get involved in violence, but they get hurt or arrested. They have religion, but somehow religion doesn't satisfy. They have the wrong kind of religion. They don't have the personal faith in Christ. You see, you can be a member of the church and you can be baptized and you can be confirmed and all of that in the church and have a job in the church, but something, there's a void inside. It hasn't really satisfied. There's something lacking. You wonder what it is. It's a personal daily relationship with Christ that's lacking. And you can find that by beginning tonight to receive Christ into your heart as Lord and Master and Savior. Jesus called it being born again. He called it repenting of sin. He called it entering the narrow gate. He said there are two roads in life. He said there's the broad road. You can have a good time on the broad road. That's where the bright lights are and that's where Las Vegas is and that's where all these other places are. You can come down that road and there's a narrow road and you enter it by a narrow gate and it's a hard life. It's not easy because you're running against the tide of humanity. Most of the people are going down the broad road, but the narrow road is the one that goes right in the middle of the broad road and you're going against the tide. So you have to have a strong faith and Christ has to be with you. The Holy Spirit has to help you. I can't live the Christian life. Billy Graham is a total flop when it comes to living the Christian life. The Holy Spirit must live it through me and in me. Now the Bible talks about the necessity of conversion. You see, you have been marred by sin like that clay that Jeremiah was talking about in the potter. He had ruined that piece of pottery. And if you went out into the hallway or into the display room, he was in the back room making these beautiful things. And out in front, you could see those beautiful pots and things that he made. But they didn't become that way automatically. He had to fashion them on the potter's wheel. They had a little pedal down below and they had a wheel that turned down there and they had another wheel up here and he, he would fashion them what he wanted to make. That's what God wants to do with you. He wants to fashion you. He has a plan for your life. Turn your life over to him. Be that pliable clay in his hands that he can work and fashion and make you a vessel like he's got in his mind for you. But there's a necessity for conversion, to be forgiven of sin. Wouldn't you like to be forgiven of every sin you've ever committed? You see, you commit sins when you don't even know it. 
There are sins of omission. For example, you passed somebody on the street that needed a helping hand and you didn't give it. Or maybe God spoke to you about giving some money to help somebody in Somalia and you haven't given it. Or maybe God spoke to you about somebody at school that you should smile at and be friends with that maybe is a lonely person that needs your friendship and you haven't done it. Those are sins of omission. And we are guilty of sins of omission, but we're guilty of sins of commission. That means sins that you deliberately commit, like telling a lie or having pride or letting other things take the place of God in your life, which is called idolatry. But you want forgiveness of those sins. That's a part of being converted to go home tonight and know that every sin is forgiven. It's under the blood of Christ. When God looks at me, he doesn't see Billy Graham. He sees the blood of Christ, which was shed on the cross for me. And it's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's a gift. God just gives it to you. If you reach up and receive by faith. But if you're going to get into heaven, you're going to have to be converted. Except ye be converted, ye shall not even enter the kingdom of heaven, the scripture says. What's involved in conversion? First, there has to be a change. A change of view. A recognition of sin as personal guilt and helplessness as far as God is concerned. Then there has to be a change of feeling. You have to be sorry for your sin. There has to be a change of purpose. It's turning from sin to Christ who died on the cross for you and rose again and is a living Christ. It also means faith. It means to commit, to surrender. Faith means that you commit yourself to Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. As many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Those that commit themselves. If we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God hath raised from the dead, we shall be saved. There's an intellectual side to it. You have to believe he's the son of God, that he died for you, that he rose again, that he's alive. There's an emotional side. You look at him dying on the cross for you and you say, I love him. But primarily it's your will. You have to say, I will receive him. I will serve him. I will follow him. Will you say that tonight? And let him change your life beginning tonight. Christ appeals to men's wills. In John 5, 40, it says, Ye will not come to me that you might have life. In Matthew 16, it says, If any man will come after me. It's not just an open mind. It's a surrendered will that leads to salvation. Many times when we get sick, we go to the doctor and he gives a prescription. We take things every day that doctors tell us to take by faith. We don't know what's in them but because we believe the doctor. Well, I believe Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, I believe that. God has given us a prescription. But first of all, it must be received by faith. It must be taken. It must be applied or it's no good. And then you become partakers of the nature of God. That's called the new birth. I may talk about that some tomorrow night. You don't inherit it. You don't deserve it. God gives it by grace. And then we must be willing to obey throughout the New Testament. There were people that Jesus called and they were converted just like that. Bartimaeus was a blind man at Jericho in that city we're reading about in the newspapers now. And he was outside begging. And he heard that Jesus was coming down the street and he cried out, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. 
And Jesus turned and spoke and healed him. And he could see Jesus was passing by. Maybe for the last time. In fact, it was the last time he went to Jericho. And if that man hadn't cried out at that moment when he had that opportunity, he might never have been saved from his blindness. Oh, the woman at the well that Jesus met on the at Sychar. She had five husbands, had had five husbands, and the man she was now living with was not her husband. Jesus said, call your husband. Well, she was right in saying she didn't have a husband. But Jesus knew all about her. And before the day was over, she had been converted and had become an evangelist and was out witnessing for Christ in the streets and won many people to Christ in Sychar, her village. That's a thief on the cross. He was dying. He deserved to die. He was a, a gangster, a robber, a murderer. And he was dying on one side of Jesus. And in the midst of it all, he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned to him, even though he was dying, and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Think of it. All he said was, remember me. That's all he had to say. You don't have to do some great thing or go through some great experience to know Christ. You just come like you are and say, Lord, remember me. By faith, I receive you. I don't understand all about you. I don't understand all about what Billy Graham has been talking about. But I do receive you. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to two passages of scripture. The first one is found in Jeremiah, or the 18th chapter. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working on a wheel. But the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. All the way through scripture, God uses little things like that. They're parables or little illustrations to illustrate spiritual truth. And he was teaching Jeremiah how God was going to deal with Judah, with Israel, if they didn't turn from their sins because they had been marred by sin. Then the next passage is found in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. But at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whosoever humbles himself like a little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humble yourself like a little child. Come to Christ like a little child in simple childlike faith and you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. But you have to become like a little child. Today, many of you here have lives like this potter's, like this clay, you've been marred. Each day we read in the newspaper about young people whose lives are marred by abuse, by drugs, by alcohol, sexually transmitted disease. The young people of today are the most analyzed in history. They've lived through a technological revolution. The older generations have several options in looking at young people. I consider myself a young people because sometimes I feel young, most of the time. Well, the older people can either ignore us or they can worship us, as some do, or resent us, or love us. However, there are millions of young people who have little parental authority. They have no set values, no moral parameters. They're not told what's right and what's wrong. 
And young people today have few role models that they can really follow. Some of the role models that they had have come crashing down and they've become discouraged and disgusted. And many young people today have not been allowed to become children. You became a teenager before you were a child. You have grown up responsibilities and decisions to make. And this puts a tremendous pressure on teenagers as they go through the roughest part of your life. The roughest part of your life is your teenage period. That's when you're changing from a boy to a man or girl to a woman. And it's when the sexual desires are the greatest. It's when the pressures for school are the greatest. And it's tough to be a young person in today's society. And the peer pressure is the toughest. And that's the reason you must take your stand for Christ and let Christ come into your heart and give you supernatural power to live the life in our society. And many young people today live in an unreal world that's been created largely by movies and television. And they have an unrealistic expectation gap. You see, if you, if you see a very complicated situation on television in a film, it's solved within the next 20 or 30 minutes on, in the movie. And then when that same problem comes before you, you think it ought to be solved immediately. And it may take years. But we expect something to be instant. But there's an emptiness and a loneliness and a lack of purpose in the hearts of many of you. The easy availability of drugs, the uncertainty of the times in which we live, the screaming headlines. And you're searching for peace and joy and pleasure. And the Bible says, in thy presence, in, your, in God's presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Do you want real joy, lasting pleasure? Oh yes, you can have a sex experience and have pleasure for a few minutes. But there is no pleasure comparable to the pleasure that Christ can give you. I feel sorry for people today that have sex without love and have sex without being married. Because in, in the marriage bond, there's no conscience to bother you. There's nothing but complete ecstasy and a joy and a thrill and an excitement that goes far beyond a sex experience that you have in high school. You didn't know that there was an extra dimension to pleasure that you haven't felt yet. In his presence, there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Well, there are thousands of young people today that just goof off. They escape responsibility and run from reality. They're searching for purpose and meaning in their lives. And many of you are asking moral questions. You're wanting to know why. Young people want change, but they have a tendency to ignore sometimes history or even human nature. Young people are searching for hope and security. One well-known man committed suicide. I read about in the paper. He left a note and he said, I have no option. I must kill myself because I'm a man without hope. We've put all the emphasis in our generation on material things of life. Many young people are now rejecting that, and they want something more, but they don't know what it is. That something more is Christ. You'll never find the joy and the pleasure and the fulfillment of life unless you know Christ. Young people are searching for a satisfying and meaningful experience. They take drugs and that destroys. They have sex, but they get bored with that or they get AIDS, they get involved in violence, but they get hurt or arrested. They have religion, but somehow religion doesn't satisfy. 
They have the wrong kind of religion. They don't have the personal faith in Christ. You see, you can be a member of the church and you can be baptized and you can be confirmed and all of that in the church and have a job in the church, but something, there's a void inside. It hasn't really satisfied. There's something lacking. You wonder what it is. It's a personal daily relationship with Christ that's lacking. And you can find that by beginning tonight to receive Christ into your heart as Lord and Master and Savior. Jesus called it being born again. He called it repenting of sin. He called it entering the narrow gate. He said there are two roads in life. He said there's the broad road. And you can have a good time on the broad road. That's where the bright lights are and that's where Las Vegas is and that's where all these other places are. You can come down that road and there's a narrow road and you enter it by a narrow gate. And it's a hard life. It's not easy because you're running against the tide of humanity. Most of the people are going down the broad road, but the narrow road is the one that goes right in the middle of the broad road and you're going against the tide. So you have to have a strong faith and Christ has to be with you. The Holy Spirit has to help you. I can't live the Christian life. Billy Graham is a total flop when it comes to living the Christian life. The Holy Spirit must live it through me and in me. Now the Bible talks about the necessity of conversion. You see, you have been marred by sin like that clay that Jeremiah was talking about in the potter. He had ruined that piece of pottery. And if you went out into the hallway or into the display room, he was in the back room making these beautiful things. And out in front, you could see those beautiful pots and things that he made. But they didn't become that way automatically. He had to fashion them on the potter's wheel. They had a little pedal down below and they had a wheel that turned down there and they had another wheel up here and he, he would fashion them what he wanted to make. That's what God wants to do with you. He wants to fashion you. He has a plan for your life. Turn your life over to him. Be that pliable clay in his hands that he can work and fashion and make you a vessel like he's got in his mind for you. But there's a necessity for conversion, to be forgiven of sin. Wouldn't you like to be forgiven of every sin you've ever committed? You see, you commit sins when you don't even know it. They're sins of omission. For example, you passed somebody on the street that needed a helping hand and you didn't give it. Or maybe God spoke to you about giving some money to help somebody in Somalia and you haven't given it. Or maybe God spoke to you about somebody at school that you should smile at and be friends with that maybe is a lonely person that needs your friendship and you haven't done it. Those are sins of omission. And we are guilty of sins of omission, but we're guilty of sins of commission. That means sins that you deliberately commit, like telling a lie or having pride or letting other things take the place of God in your life, which is called idolatry. But you want forgiveness of those sins. That's a part of being converted to go home tonight and know that every sin is forgiven. It's under the blood of Christ. When God looks at me, he doesn't see Billy Graham. He sees the blood of Christ, which was shed on the cross for me. And it's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's a gift. God just gives it to you. If you reach up and receive by faith. But if you're going to get into heaven, you're going to have to be converted. Except ye be converted, ye shall not even enter the kingdom of heaven, the scripture says. What's involved in conversion? First, there has to be a change. A change of view, a recognition of sin as personal guilt and helplessness as far as God is concerned. Then there has to be a change of feeling. You have to be sorry for your sin. There has to be a change of purpose. It's turning from sin to Christ who died on the cross for you and rose again and is a living Christ. It also means faith. 
It means to commit, to surrender. Faith means that you commit yourself to Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. As many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Those that commit themselves. If we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God hath raised from the dead, we shall be saved. There's an intellectual side to it. You have to believe he's the son of God, that he died for you, that he rose again, that he's alive. There's an emotional side. You look at him dying on the cross for you and you say, I love him. But primarily it's your will. You have to say, I will receive him. I will serve him. I will follow him. Will you say that tonight? And let him change your life beginning tonight. Christ appeals to men's wills. In John 5, 40, it says, Ye will not come to me that you might have life. In Matthew 16, it says, If any man will come after me. It's not just an open mind. It's a surrendered will that leads to salvation. Many times when we get sick, we go to the doctor and he gives a prescription. We take things every day that doctors tell us to take by faith. We don't know what's in them but because we believe the doctor. Well, I believe Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, I believe that. God has given us a prescription. But first of all, it must be received by faith. It must be taken. It must be applied or it's no good. And then you become partakers of the nature of God. That's called the new birth. I may talk about that some tomorrow night. You don't inherit it. You don't deserve it. God gives it by grace. And then we must be willing to obey throughout the New Testament. There were people that Jesus called and they were converted just like that. Bartimaeus was a blind man at Jericho in that city we're reading about in the newspapers now. And he was outside begging. And he heard that Jesus was coming down the street and he cried out, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus turned and spoke and healed him. And he could see Jesus was passing by, maybe for the last time. In fact, it was the last time he went to Jericho. And if that man hadn't cried out at that moment when he had that opportunity, he might never have been saved from his blindness. Oh, the woman at the well that Jesus met on the, at Sychar, she had five husbands, had had five husbands, and the man she was now living with was not her husband. Jesus said, call your husband. Well, she was right in saying she didn't have a husband. But Jesus knew all about her. And before the day was over, she had been converted and had become an evangelist and was out witnessing for Christ in the streets and won many people to Christ in Sychar, her village. There's a thief on the cross. He was dying. He deserved to die. He was a, a gangster, a robber, a murderer. And he was dying on one side of Jesus. And in the midst of it all, he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned to him, even though he was dying and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Think of it. All he said was, remember me. That's all he had to say. You don't have to do some great thing. or go through some great experience to know Christ. You just come like you are and say, Lord, remember me. By faith, I receive you. I don't understand all about you. I don't understand all about what Billy Graham has been talking about, but I do receive you.
Revelation, the second chapter. And the reason I'm taking Revelation is because I, we went to Florence some time ago in Italy. And I remember the great revival that swept Florence under the preaching of Savonarola in the 15th century. And how that city given over to debauchery and wickedness and sin of every description. And the poor were just treated as animals. And he began to preach and he preached every sermon from the book of Revelation. And he had three points. One was that you must repent of your sins. Second, you better repent quickly because judgment is coming. And thirdly, it's coming very soon. And those are the three main points that Savonarola had. And it turned a great city upside down for Christ. And tonight I want to turn to the book of Revelation, the second chapter and the third chapter. And I want to take one point from each of the messages that our Lord gave to the seven churches of which are now in Turkey, but Asia Minor called in those days because they are messages for the churches or the broadcasters in any generation for all Christians in any generation. And we ought to be reading them and preaching them and studying them. I wish I had a whole hour to talk on each one or a whole week because I've been studying them for quite some time now and God has spoken to me. And he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the broadcasters, the religious broadcasters that are here tonight. And I believe we will find a message for all of us in these verses in this part of Revelation. I wrote a book some time ago called The Four Horsemen about the white horse, which I believe is the Antichrist, which I believe is is going to come in the name of peace and we've never heard so much talk about peace in all of our lives as we hear today then there's the red horse war and the black horse famine the pale horse death and hell and i believe that these messages are the ones that we ought to think about tonight as i thought about what i should say i can hear those horsemen Everywhere I go in the world, I don't care whether it's Africa or Asia or Latin America or the Eastern world or the Western world, I hear the hoofbeats of those horsemen. They're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And Ephesus is the first church that is listening to those hoofbeats. And it represents a call to personal renewal. You remember Paul spent three years there and on to every one of the churches, Jesus says, repent, but to Smyrna and Philadelphia, but to all, he said, I know your works. And he says to all of us, I know you, I know your work. I know those associated with you. I know your motives. I know your intents. I know your thoughts. I know everything. You don't have to tell me anything. I know. I know what motivates you. Now these people had worked hard, he said. They endured much, they were patient, and they had courage to throw out error. But he said, I have something against you. What could be against a church like that? He said, you have left your first love. He didn't say you'd lost it. He said, you've left it. A matter of the will. You will to leave it. And I often think in our work, in my own work, how easy it is to lose the first love. Like a marriage, there's the honeymoon, the children come, problems come, tensions come, and that first passionate love dwindles and fails and is gone in many couples. And the same had happened to Ephesus. They'd lost the intensity of that first love. And I don't believe that you can lead the church through broadcasting any further than you've given yourself. And the quality of a Christian broadcast will reflect the spiritual quality of the broadcaster, including the technicians and the people that do the announcing 
and the people that do the preaching and present the music. If you've lost your first love, you can rediscover it. Ask yourself why you got into this ministry in the first place. Remember your past joys and past commitments and past concerns. And remember those early prayer meetings when you got on your knees, just you and God, and you didn't have any money and you believed God and God brought you to where you are in broadcast. And the message that he has for us tonight is to change. Repent, he says. Do we need to repent and go back to some of those early days when we had those great spiritual mountaintop experiences with the Lord? You and your wife holding hands on your knees beside the bed. The moment you were converted, the hour that you vowed to God something and you've sort of forgotten that vow. The second one is Smyrna represents the call to suffering. And for the broadcaster, it's in two dimensions because when I stand, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way, when you stand before a camera or you stand before a microphone, there's an unseen audience. And you can visualize the suffering that's going on in those tenement houses among the homeless, the alcoholics, the tensions in the home, those that are suffering from poverty. Many people hurting. I have a son-in-law that's a psychologist, and he tells me story after story of the hurting people that come to him. I have another son-in-law that's a dentist. He, he might as well be a psychologist because being a Christian, before they get their teeth fixed, they're scared anyway. They're telling him all their troubles and all their problems. And he's more interested in winning souls for Christ than he is filling teeth or pulling teeth or whatever he does to them. And this is what I think our Lord is talking about. In a place of suffering, God has his people. And I try to think of those people as I'm sure you do, that suffer physically, psychologically, from various forms of persecution, there's all kinds of persecution that we feel. We're accused of all kinds of things. And Paul said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. If you're not being tempted and tested, there may be something wrong with our Christian commitment. I remember when I started out, I was kicked from all over the place. And from one side, now I'm kicked from the other side a little bit more, and I'm in the middle, and I'm getting kicked from both sides. <laughs> but Jesus said, be faithful unto death. He that endureth to the end shall be saved, and fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Blessed are ye when men shall persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. But be sure it's for his sake. And then Pergamos. It's the call to pure doctrine how we need to stand at the foot of the cross and make the kerygma of the cross and the resurrection the heart of our ministry Amen. and tell people what to do. I find more people that know the gospel, but they don't know how to receive Christ. Tell them what to do. Tell them they need to repent of their sins and receive Christ by faith and then explain what repentance and faith is so they'll know what to do. Now, Pergamos, of course, was a very terrible city in that it was a place where Satan's throne was. And Paul had written to the Corinthians and said false apostles and deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And there are people like that. Many antichrists are abroad. I remember Vernon McGee once said that he thought that the throne of Satan was in Los Angeles. But here it says it was in Pergamos. I think it's in all of our cities. And Satan is at work. And how often do we hear messages today warning the people about the devil? My wife was sitting beside the head of the counterfeiting department of Scotland Yard in London some years ago. And she said, I suppose you spend a lot of time studying counterfeit bills. And he said, no, I never look at one. I study the real thing. And if we keep our eyes on Christ, we'll know when the counterfeit comes along. 
keep our eyes on him. And then to all these churches, Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'll take my power from you. Samson, I often think of him, got up as strong as ever, he thought. And God's power had been removed. And he shook himself as of old and nothing happened. We advocate purity. Because that's where we come to Thyatira. Thyatira is a call to pure and righteous living. And sometimes we have a tendency to make a call to pure living too easy. The psalmist said, I have walked in mine integrity. And someone asked me what I wanted on my tombstone. And one of the things I get now as I'm getting older, people are telling me how well I look. <laughs> That's right. And I remember Tom Zimmerman told me one time, when they start telling you that, you know you're up there. <laughs> and my daughter-in-law was talking about somebody the other day, and she said, an elderly gentleman, I think he must have been at least 60 years of age. <laughs> and then she thought and bowed her head and blushed. But I told him on my tombstone, I would rather have written there than almost anything that I have lived a life of integrity, a life of integrity. And those of us that are broadcasters are models to so many people. And we have such a tremendous responsibility, not only to preach it and tell it, but to live it. And I have failed so miserably in many areas. And then Sardis represents the call to awaken to the issues of our time. We heard some of those issues discussed. Peace, racism, poverty, and all the rest of it. He says, now wake up and strengthen what you still have before it dies. But there are other issues. There's the issue of eternity. Death. Everybody in this room will be dead in 50, 60 years. You know, it's interesting to me to watch people walk down the street and I know that they'll be dead in a short time. Or I see them on television and they're already dead. They're still acting, but they're dead. <laughs> and how we take death lightly. I wrote, um, we're holding a crusade beginning Sunday week in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. A wonderful time of year to hold it there. <laughs> All the sinners from the north are down there. <laughs> And uh, my son-in-law, my son-in-law practices his psychology there, and I asked him what would be a good topic to talk on. He said, death. He said, a lot of these people retire down here thinking about death. And the hope of the second coming of Christ and hell. How long has it been since you heard a sermon on hell? I sometimes wonder if we even believe it anymore. That there is a place where people are going that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's forever. And it's so serious, it weighs on me as I think about it. Because I'm giving a lot of thought to heaven too. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Hypocrisy, he said, repent. Then Philadelphia is the call to awaken to the opportunities of our time in evangelism. There's a door open that no man can shut. Then the last church is Laodicea. This is a call to act boldly with holy passion. Laodicea represents complacency. They depended on their own strength. And you know, I sometimes wonder if we're not depending on the computer more than the Holy Spirit in a great deal of what we're doing. And I thought to myself how much we're depending in our own work on computers and on technology. And thank God for the great technology. I believe it's a gift from God to reach the whole world in our generation for Christ. We may not have another generation, but I'm also wondering if somehow we're putting a little more dependence on the technology and less on the power of the Holy Spirit. And our Lord says, repent or I'll remove my power. You see, they had said, I'm rich, I've prospered, there's nothing I need. God says, you have no eyes to see that you're wretched and pitiful and poverty stricken and blind and naked. He said, repent 
or I'll remove my power. And the thing that I fear most of all is that as I get older and come to the end of my ministry, that I might make a mistake and do something that would bring disrepute to the name of Christ and have his power removed and be a castaway. As Paul said, he feared. I fear that more than anything else in the world. And I would lay upon your hearts. Let's once again lay a hold upon the altar and pray that God will do it again as he did in the days of Savonarola. Thank you and God bless you. Revelation is because I, we went to Florence some time ago in Italy. And I remember the great revival that swept Florence under the preaching of Savonarola in the 15th century and how that city given over to debauchery and wickedness and sin of every description and the poor were just treated as animals. And he began to preach and he preached every sermon from the book of Revelation. And he had three points. One was that you must repent of your sins. Second, you better repent quickly because judgment is coming. And thirdly, it's coming very soon. And those are the three main points that Savonarola had. And it turned a great city upside down for Christ. And tonight I want to turn to the book of Revelation, the second chapter and the third chapter. And I want to take one point from each of the messages that our Lord gave to the seven churches of which are now in Turkey, but Asia Minor called in those days, because they are messages for the churches or the broadcasters in any generation, for all Christians in any generation. And we ought to be reading them and preaching them and studying them. I wish I had a whole hour to talk on each one or a whole week because I've been studying them for quite some time now, and God has spoken to me. And he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the broadcasters, the religious broadcasters that are here tonight. And I believe we will find a message for all of us in these verses in this part of Revelation. I wrote a book some time ago called The Four Horsemen about the white horse, which I believe is the Antichrist, which I believe is, is going to come in the name of peace. And we've never heard so much talk about peace in all of our lives as we hear today. Then there's the red horse, war, and the black horse, famine, the pale horse, death and hell. And I believe that these messages are the ones that we ought to think about tonight, as I thought about what I should say. I can hear those horsemen everywhere I go in the world. I don't care whether it's Africa or Asia or Latin America or the Eastern world or the Western world. I hear the hoofbeats of those horsemen. They're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And Ephesus is the first church that is listening to those hoofbeats. And it represents a call to personal renewal. You remember Paul spent three years there. And on to every one of the churches, Jesus says, repent, but to Smyrna and Philadelphia. But to all, he said, I know your works. And he says to all of us, I know you. I know your work. I know those associated with you. I know your motives. I know your intents. I know your thoughts. I know everything. You don't have to tell me anything. I know. I know what motivates you. Now, these people had worked hard, he said. They endured much. They were patient. And they had courage to throw out error. But he said, I have something against you. What could be against a church like that? He said, you have left your first love. He didn't say you'd lost it. He said you've left it. A matter of the will. You will to leave it. 
And I often think in our work, in my own work, how easy it is to lose the first love. Like a marriage, there's the honeymoon, the children come, problems come, tensions come, and that first passionate love dwindles and fails and is gone in many couples. And the same had happened to Ephesus. They'd lost the intensity of that first love. And I don't believe that you can lead the church through broadcasting any further than you've given yourself. And the quality of a Christian broadcast will reflect the spiritual quality of the broadcaster, including the technicians and the people that do the announcing and the people that do the preaching and present the music. If you've lost your first love, you can rediscover it. Ask yourself why you got into this ministry in the first place. Remember your past joys and past commitments and past concerns. And remember those early prayer meetings when you got on your knees, just you and God, and you didn't have any money and you believed God and God brought you to where you are in broadcast. And the message that he has for us tonight is to change. Repent, he says. Do we need to repent and go back to some of those early days when we had those great spiritual mountaintop experiences with the Lord? You and your wife holding hands on your knees beside the bed. The moment you were converted. The hour that you vowed to God something and you've sort of forgotten that vow. The second one is Smyrna represents the call to suffering. And for the broadcaster, it's in two dimensions, because when I stand, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way. When you stand before a camera or you stand before a microphone, there's an unseen audience. And you can visualize the suffering that's going on in those tenement houses among the homeless, the alcoholics, the tensions in the home, those that are suffering from poverty. Many people hurting. I have a son-in-law that's a psychologist, and he tells me story after story of the hurting people that come to him. I have another son-in-law that's a dentist. He, he might as well be a psychologist because being a Christian, before they get their teeth fixed, they're scared anyway. They're telling him all their troubles and all their problems, and he's more interested in winning souls for Christ than he is filling teeth or pulling teeth or whatever he does to them. And this is what I think our Lord is talking about. In a place of suffering, God has his people. And I try to think of those people, as I'm sure you do, that suffer physically, psychologically, from various forms of persecution, there's all kinds of persecution that we feel. We're accused of all kinds of things. And Paul said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. If you are not being tempted and tested, there may be something wrong with our Christian commitment. I remember when I started out, I was kicked from all over the place. And from one side, now I'm kicked from the other side a little bit more, and I'm in the middle, and I'm getting kicked from both sides. <laughs> but Jesus said, be faithful unto death. He that endureth to the end shall be saved, and fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Blessed are ye when men shall persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. But be sure it's for his sake. And then Pergamos. It's the call to pure doctrine how we need to stand at the foot of the cross and make the kerygma of the cross and the resurrection the heart of our ministry Amen. and tell people what to do. I find more people that know the gospel, but they don't know how to receive Christ. Tell them what to do. Tell them they need to repent of their sins and receive Christ by faith and then explain what repentance and faith is so they'll know what to do. Now, Pergamos, of course, was a very terrible city in that it was a place where Satan's throne was. And Paul had written to the Corinthians and said false apostles and deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 
Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And there are people like that. Many antichrists are abroad. I remember Vernon McGee once said that he thought that the throne of Satan was in Los Angeles. But here it says it was in Pergamos. I think it's in all of our cities. And Satan is at work. And how often do we hear messages today warning the people about the devil? My wife was sitting beside the head of the counterfeiting department of Scotland Yard in London some years ago. And she said, I suppose you spend a lot of time studying counterfeit bills. And he said, no, I never look at one. I study the real thing. And if we keep our eyes on Christ, we'll know when the counterfeit comes along. Keep our eyes on him. And then to all these churches, Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'll take my power from you. Samson, I often think of him, got up as strong as ever, he thought. And God's power had been removed. And he shook himself as of old and nothing happened. We advocate purity because that's where we come to Thyatira. Thyatira is a call to pure and righteous living. And sometimes we have a tendency to make a call to pure living too easy. The psalmist said, I have walked in mine integrity. And someone asked me what I wanted on my tombstone. And one of the things I get now as I'm getting older, people are telling me how well I look. (laughs) That's right. And I remember Tom Zimmerman told me one time, when they start telling you that, you know you're up there. (laughs) And my daughter-in-law was talking about somebody the other day, and she said, an elderly gentleman, I think he must have been at least 60 years of age. (laughs) And then she thought and bowed her head and blushed. But I told him on my tombstone, I would rather have written there than almost anything that I have lived a life of integrity. A life of integrity. And those of us that are broadcasters are models to so many people. And we have such a tremendous responsibility not only to preach it and tell it, but to live it. And I have failed so miserably in many areas. And then Sardis represents the call to awaken to the issues of our time. We heard some of those issues discussed. Peace, racism, poverty. And all the rest of it. He says, now wake up and strengthen what you still have before it dies. But there are other issues. There's the issue of eternity. Death. Everybody in this room will be dead in 50, 60 years. You know, it's interesting to me to watch people walk down the street and I know that they'll be dead in a short time. I see them on television and they're already dead. They're still acting, but they're dead. And how we take death lightly. I wrote, um, we're holding a crusade beginning Sunday week in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. A wonderful time of year to hold it there. All the sinners from the north are down there. And uh, my son-in-law, my son-in-law practices his psychology there. And I asked him what would be a good topic to talk on. He said death. He said a lot of these people retire down here thinking about death. And the hope of the second coming of Christ and hell. How long has it been since you heard a sermon on hell? I sometimes wonder if we even believe it anymore. That there is a place where people are going that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's forever. And it's so serious. It weighs on me as I think about it. Because I'm giving a lot of thought to heaven too. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Hypocrisy, he said, repent. Then Philadelphia is the call to awaken to the opportunities of our time in evangelism. There's a door open that no man can shut. Then the last church is Laodicea. This is a call to act boldly with holy passion. Laodicea represents complacency. They depended on their own strength. And you know, I sometimes wonder if we're not depending on the computer 
more than the Holy Spirit in a great deal of what we're doing. And I thought to myself how much we're depending in our own work on computers and on technology. And thank God for the great technology. I believe it's a gift from God to reach the whole world in our generation for Christ. We may not have another generation, but I'm also wondering if somehow we're putting a little more dependence on the technology and less on the power of the Holy Spirit. And our Lord says, repent or I'll remove my power. You see, they had said, I'm rich. I've prospered. There's nothing I need. God says you have no eyes to see that you're wretched and pitiful and poverty stricken and blind and naked. He said, repent. I'll remove my power. And the thing that I fear most of all is that as I get older and come to the end of my ministry, that I might make a mistake and do something that would bring disrepute to the name of Christ and have his power removed and be a castaway, as Paul said he feared. I fear that more than anything else in the world. And I would lay upon your hearts. Let's once again lay a hold upon the altar and pray that God will do it again as he did in the days of Savonarola. Thank you and God bless you.